Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here and to see everybody so convivial and chatting outside. And um, I think we're, we're all in for a treat with today's lecture. So I'm Catherine Kasdorf. I'm the Associate Curator of Arts of Asia and the Islamic World here at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And we welcome you today. We are very excited to have Frank Feltons with us today from the National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, DC, uh, to speak on Sotatsu's famous screen paintings, Waves at Matsushima, their Detroit history with Charles Lang Freer, and their recent reproduction through the innovative methods of the Tsuzuri Project, which is bringing high quality facsimiles of Japanese works of art from worldwide collections to new audiences in Japan. So before we introduce Dr. Feltons, uh, I'd like to thank our many sponsors and supporters, supporters that have made the lecture this afternoon possible. At the DIA, thanks go to the Friends of Asian Arts and Cultures, a membership auxiliary group that supports a rich range of DIA programs related to Asian and Islamic artistic traditions and present day cultures. And you can learn more about FAAC and know, learn how to become a member um, if you pick up one of our brochures outside. I was pleased to co-sponsor a lecture with our neighbors at the Freer House, part of the Merrill Palmer Skillman Institute at Wayne State University. Our joint interests in Asian and Islamic art in Detroit have fostered a wonderful relationship that has benefited members of both our organizations. And this year, we're joined by the Japan, American Soci Japan America Society of Michigan and Southwestern Ontario, which together with the National Association of Japan America so Societies has been key to bringing this Tsuzuri Project lecture to Detroit. We're grateful for their support as well as the support of the United States Japan Foundation and its curator's perspective subsidiary. And I'd um, also like to thank Consul General Yusuke Shindo and Mrs. Seiko Shindo for supporting the lecture and for being here today. Thank you so much. Last but not least, uh, my thanks go to William Colburn, director of the Freer House, and Lizan Guen, president of the Japan America Society of Michigan and Southwestern Ontario, as well as their colleagues and my colleagues at the DIA for all the planning and coordination. Now I'd like to welcome Lizan to the stage to say a bit more about the project. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. We're thrilled to see such a big crowd. Um, this is going to be an interesting story about Japanese art and its connection to the city of Detroit. We're very grateful to the DIA Friends of Asian Arts and Cultures, as well as to the Freer House, Merrill Palmer Skillman Institute at Wayne State University for this opportunity. We're especially thankful to Dr. Feltons for coming and telling this great story. The Japan America Society endeavors to promote positive and mutually beneficial relations among Japanese and American people. One of the ways we do this is by exchanging cultural and artistic traditions, and also by recognizing the long and enduring US-Japan cultural and architectural associations that we have here in Detroit. So we hope that this mutual cultural awareness enriches us all, and that it makes the Japanese people who are working here in industry feel at home in Michigan. I would like to recognize some special guests, Consul General Shindo of Japan and Mrs. Seiko Shindo, as well as the Consul General of Canada, Colin Bird, and Mrs. Stacy Bird. Today's program is supported by a grant from the National Association of Japan America Societies with funding from the United States Japan Foundation with the cooperation of the Kyoto Cultural Association. And here from the National Association of Japan America Societies in Washington, DC, is the president, Andy Wiley Gala. If I could ask him to come up for one minute. He's going to introduce Frank Feltons. Thank you very much, Lizanne, and hello, everybody. And it is amazing to see a turnout like this in a holiday-shortened weekend. 
And I know that's because of, uh, of the topic and the provocative title that Dr. Felton has, has given us. We all want to uh, hear about who's making waves. And, and of course, um, to hear from Dr. Felton is a, is a real treat. And it's also a testament to the, the fabulous organization. And you heard the two women from two of the organizations that were so important in putting the, the program together. And of course, uh, equal thanks to D Director Colburn and the, um, the, the Freer House and the MPS Institute at Wayne State University for, for making all of this possible. So as mentioned, I'm Andy Wiligala, the president of the National Association of Japan America Societies coming in from Washington. I actually have ties to the region and I'm ashamed to say this is actually my first real visit to Detroit, even though I grew up in Buffalo, New York, not so far away, and a place that shares a lot of the heritage and traditions and cultures and welcoming of, uh, uh, of immigrants and melting pots, uh, uh, as, does, as does Detroit. A little bit about Najes, and um, there are many sponsors and folks who came together to make this possible, but we've got a sign up there, and that's for a reason. We're one of the organizers, but we're also a very unique organization that's almost unknown. So I just want to take a moment to let you know what this association is about. We're a federation of 38 independent local Japan America societies across North America, not just the United States. Toronto is one of our fond members. Uh, and we have only one trilateral organization. And of course, that's right here, Japan America Society of Michigan and Southwestern Ontario bridges the border and gives us that North American uh, credibility. Uh, it's a fantastic, um, uh, uh, dynamic and vibrant organization, which I would encourage all of you to tap into. Uh, because today, we're going to be talking about connections and access. That's really what our federation does, those two things. And that's the touch point of today's uh, discussion. The connections you're going to hear about are between Detroit and, and Washington, D.C., between Charles Lang Freer and Teddy Roosevelt, between Detroit and Japan, between the U.S. and Japan. Another important connection that you can live right here or in the Grand Hall is the connection between industry and technology and the arts. That's something that Detroit can be uh, really uniquely proud of. Uh, we at Najus are, are about making those connections between groups, and we're also about access. I think that's the other element that you're going to be hearing a lot about today. The replicas themselves represent uh, a, an opportunity to provide much greater access to rare and very fragile uh, art treasures, such as the waves at, at, at Matsushima. Uh, and also, Detroit played a bigger role in access. Because after all, it's around the corner and 117 years ago that that very uh, far-sighted and generous gift of Charles Lang Freer um, to uh, 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 the federal government uh, laid the groundwork to set up the very first national museum uh, of art in, in the United States. And that's an incredible push towards, uh, towards access. So we're all about those things. As a federation, we have three roles. We're an umbrella group, and we advocate for US-Japan relations, one of the most important binational relations in the world today. So we're advocates there. We also provide some capacity. So we try to help these 38 societies uh, become as dynamic as the one you folks enjoy right here in Detroit and southwestern on, on Ontario. And then thirdly, we're a channel for content. We bring programs. not into Washington, but from Washington and Japan out to the United States. And I wanted to just mention the kind of areas where we work in addition to arts and cultures. So we might have a program on the hydrogen economy, uh, how are US and Japanese businesses working together, and then in one city. And then the next week, uh, we might have a program, how are Japan and the United States working on addressing the China challenge today? So diplomatic and geostrategy, we have a series of, of lectures and programs on that. Military to military relationships. Every year, some 50,000 Americans are living and working in Japan and coming back with uh, pretty strongly positive um, uh, experiences and feelings about Japan. So we would like to energize that group and have them connect 
with the wider population in, in, in the United States. And of course, our, this program, a predecessor program, uh, is very important to us, educational exchange as well. So those are the uh, realms, if you uh, will, that we, we work in. So this is part of a series, a new series, Curator's Perspectives on, on Digital Art, the, the replicas that you're going to be hearing about in a moment from, uh, from, from Dr. Dr. Felton's. Uh, you know, we are looking forward to continuing this program and really leveraging uh, its capacity to further these connections and, of course, access, uh, getting more people to be exposed to and be able to appreciate uh, treasures like, like waves at, at Matsushima. Connection with that series, our speaker plays a key role. He's not only going to give you a, a wonderful presentation about the art and the artist, and these uh, technical and social issues about um, uh, the use of replicas and the location of artwork, but he is in fact the designer of this program. So we're very pleased and proud that Dr. Feltons could be here to, uh, today because he's played such a fundamental role in this, in this incredible series. So Dr. Frank Feltons is the Japan Foundation uh, Associate Curator of Japanese Art at the Freer Gallery of Art and the Smithsonian National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, D.C., and he's had that position since about 2017. He's a specialist in Japanese uh, uh, painting from the medieval and early modern period, but his interests are far broader than that. He's also very strong in the areas of ceramics and has a strong interest in photography, which bodes very well for what he's going to be telling you about the Tsuzuri project and these uh, uh, very exacting uh, replicas that we're going to be here learning about. He has a long interest also and is quite accomplished in the area of uh, the tea ceremony. Uh, and, and I was enjoying the wonderful exhibit here in the gallery on, on, on tea as well. Uh, Dr. Feltons is a native of Germany. He has also worked at the National Museum of Asian Art in Berlin, the Nezu Gallery in Tokyo, and Sensoji, the oldest temple, in, uh, in, in Tokyo as well. He has a PhD in art history from Columbia University. I think he used his COVID downtime exceptionally well because Dr. Feltons is the author or co-author of a half dozen books, a lot of them quite recent. While I was in Tokyo, I had the opportunity to drop by uh, the Japan Foundation, and they have a lovely library I'd recommend if anybody is there. It just so happened I hadn't had a chance to tell you, Frank, but when I walked into the lobby, there was one book that caught my eye from the color um, of, uh, of the cover, and it was set out. Somebody had been reading it, and it was Dr. Felton's 21 uh, book on, on Ogata Korin, um, a, uh, a painter of the same Rimpa school that we're going to be hearing about um, today. So they've got a super qualified uh, speaker in art and art history to talk to us, uh, the architect of, of, of this program. So we're just delighted to have Dr. Frank Felton's, please. Thank you, Andy, for this really full-throated endorsement, and I hope I won't be disappointing anyone. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, it's, it's great to see all of you here, and especially like Andy mentioned, on a weekend before a holiday week. I mean, we are having trouble filling our museum during, that, uh, during this weekend, so it's wonderful to see so many of you here. And uh, I also want to join uh, Catherine, Andy, and Lizanne in thanking the organizers of this lecture and uh, you know, DIA, DIA's very own curator of Asian arts, Catherine Kastorf, and then Li Zhengguan of the Jap Japan America Society, and Andy, of course, of Nages, who uh, you know, has helped initiate the, this, uh, this program, and then William Colburn as well from the Freer House at Wayne State University. So it's kind of a homecoming for me in a way, a pilgrimage to the roots of Freer. Uh, but before I delve into my part of the program, I, we want to show you a little video for uh, just about four minutes that uh, explains a project that the National Museum of Asian Art at the Smithsonian has been involved in for about a decade, where we are working with Canon and Kyoto Culture Association in creating really high-level replicas of, of, of key Japanese paintings in our collection with the aim of, of bring, uh, returning them to the, to the country 
that they were made in and making them available for people there, but also for uh, educational purposes, for different kinds of display. And I promise that there is a direct connection to the story of our museum here in Detroit uh, that I'll be uh, getting into as we are uh, you know, moving forward in our uh, event today. So if we could show the video, that would be great. Thanks. State-of-the-art image capture, image processing, and printing technology, and traditional Japanese artisan skills combined to create Suzuki project works that are faithful to the originals. The original work is photographed using a mirrorless camera capable of high resolution of 45 million pixels. The artwork is automatically photographed in sections to capture detailed data. Color elements such as ink and mineral pigments, reflective materials such as gold and silver leaf, and the subtle texture of organic whitewash are accurately recorded. For the Wind and Thunder Gods folding screens, each screen was photographed as 168 frames. Each small frame is ultra high resolution, 12 times more than a full HD image. The 168 frames were recombined to create 4.2 billion pixels of super high resolution data. Subtle tonal variations may be difficult to reproduce when captured image data is printed out as is. For each original work, the Tsuzuri project extracts information necessary to create a precise, unique color profile. This unique color matching technology accurately recreates the colors of the original work. Colors can be compared with the original on the spot within the shooting environment. A high-performance, large-format printer maximizes the results of sophisticated color matching. Dimensional depth and textures seen in the original are meticulously reproduced. Artisans demonstrate their mastery of traditional Kyoto skills, applying the finishing touches to Tsuzuri project works that are as close as possible to the original cultural assets. From image capture through finishing, state-of-the-art technology is applied to create high-resolution facsimiles. The paired screens of the wind and thunder gods recreate the tonal variations, brush strokes, and texture of the original cultural assets as faithfully as possible. We encourage you to take a close look at this Suzuki project work. because you didn't come here to watch videos, but to actually hear in real person speaking. But, um, but I promise that there, is a, there, there, that there is a connection to the video or to the project, but this is really the contemporary manifestation of, I think, a long journey that started in the city. And I also wanna begin by saying how grateful I am to be given this opportunity to speak to you today, in, especially in the city where our museum's founder, Charles Langfrier, has made his fortune, but also left many marks. And I should say we are now called the National Museum of Asian Art, but one part of our museum is the Freer Gallery of Art, which was the, uh, the, the part of its, uh, the, the, the core 
uh, part of the museum at its founding in 1923. Um, and so as I'm making uh, the pilgrimage to Charles Langfrier's roots this weekend, I am reminded of the different ways in which he touched the lives of people and places in the city. And I really uh, uh, you know, feel very inspired by my visit here this weekend and really hope that I can carry some of that with me back to DC. So, so we are moving back in time from the Tsuzuri project um, so to the 17th century. The Japanese folding screens waves at Matsushima uh, one, one example by which Freer linked people and places across time and space from Japan to Detroit to Washington DC, spanning nearly 120 years. I am delighted to explore this connection and that journey with you today. But let's first take a look at the screen. Uh, in the right screen of the pair, and as you know, Japanese folding screens often come either as single screens, but or, or more often than that as pairs. So in the, this, what you see is the right screen. And with uh, islands amid stormy waves, the seawater splashing against them. Um, and Sotas is known for his emphatically flat and stylized forms, which you really champion, and which to us, I think, really do have a little bit of a modern feel to them. And that's, um, you know, there is a reason for it, because a lot of, um, you know, Western artists were inspired by that. Uh, but Sotatsu painted his waves in a really particular way that where the waves, wave crests are these almost ghostly fingers crawling up the islands, almost like specters emerging from the seas. So the islands themselves are painted in thick green, which is malachite, but which, like many uh, traditional Japanese pigments, is sourced from minerals. Uh, Japanese pigments always come in powder form and need to be bound with an adhesive made from animal glue by boiling down antlers or hooves. And I have witnessed that process in our conservation studio many times, and it's very stinky and a nasty kind of production, but it's an essential part of Japanese painting for sure. Um, so the mineral green, though, glistens against the light and giving the surface a crystalline luster that appears both fresh and ancient at the same time. So these works really do have you know, a taste of age, but at the same time, in certain parts, they look very almost new still 400 years after. The waves uh, that Sotatsu painted in long strokes of ink uh, often branch out into these finger, or I would say noodle-like tips that are so characteristic of Sotatsu's practice. Strokes in gold pigment between the lines give the work additional luster and sumptuousness. In spite of their stylized rendering, I think Sotatsu managed to capture the essence and also the personality of the sea. It's sort of twisting, prancing, and it's pooling mood. So this ocean is, is moody, and Sotatsu kind of captured that in his own very, very specific way. The many, the many areas of gold, and especially the lavish use of expensive malachite green and azurite blue, would have made this an incredibly expensive commission at the time. And I cannot resist but also point out and do some embedded advertising for one of our sponsors today, and how relevant Sotatsu style is today. So you see that logo right there on, on Andy's uh, uh, sign right there. So the types of waves uh, Sotatsu painted became a real staple of traditional Japanese style painting and other art forms all the way to America. For example, the logo of NAGES, the National Association of Japan America Societies, I'd like to say, uh, you know, uh, takes some inspiration from the tradition that Sotatsu inspired. And, but I also should say that art historians always like to project oftentimes like to, I love to project things at my own <laughs> interpretations onto things, so this might be just me overthinking, uh, but I guess you can see the, the similarities here as well, though. So uh, the left half of the pair uh, is even more interesting than its partner on the right. There are more of the same waves, but there is also a strange amorphous shape right here on, let's see, right here, um, that looks like a cloud or a sandbank, or both. It was painted in flakes of gold leaf at the center with a perimeter of silver around it. The silver is oxidized, as is often the case over time, from a glistening shiny smooth surface to a brownish color 
with a dull texture. So this happens a lot in Japanese paintings. Painters like Sotatsu were aware of this gradual change in appearance and often played with it, knowing that their works would transform over the course of time and their life cycles. And I should also mention that the same shape appears in other works as well, but no one really knows what it was supposed to represent. So this is one of the mysteries, and many mysteries in Sotatsu's practice. He is known uh, to have repeated the shame, same shapes in different contexts. So he's using these modules scattered throughout his works, uh, which is one of his major innovations as an artist. I believe that Sotatsu deliberately engaged in a game of hide and seek with his audience, with you. <laughs> of concealing and revealing, in a way. He was trying to engage you, the viewer, to furrow your eyebrows and to really zero in on these artworks. That is true in 400 years ago, and it's still true today, I believe. But there is, uh, there is more going on in these screens, and before I get into fear, I cannot resist but going on a little bit about Sotatsu's life, too. In Waves at Matsushima, the right screen of the pair is a band of clouds in the upper left, right here. Do you see, see this here? And many of you might be familiar with that practice in Japanese painting, but it's meant to suggest perspectival depth. It's a, it's a technique to create perspective and, and recession in space in traditional Japanese painting. And normally that band of clouds uh, would connect to its equivalent in the left screen. So it would become another band of clouds. That's the convention that you would expect. Sotatsu, however, uh, transforms the clouds into a sandbank with pine trees, which uh, I have yet to see in any other painting. So he is the only one I know of, and I've seen a lot of Japanese paintings uh, that did this. So he is turning something airy into something solid, playing with convention and expectation in a really interesting way. I think this is one of the reasons for his long-lasting fame and one of the great skills that Charles Lang Freer saw in Sotatsu's work. So for the remainder of the talk, I would like to delve into the life of these screens, Waves at Matsushima, from its making in the early 17th century to Charles Lang Freer's encounter with them in the early 20th century down to our own time in 2023, basically. Um, so let's go back to the beginning. Today the painting carries the name Waves at Matsushima, but that's a modern name that was given to it. it didn't, we don't know what it was called before. And the name refers directly to a famous site in northeastern Japan, right here off the coast of the city of Sendai in Iwate Prefecture, that is famous for its pine islands in the sea. The place had been a poetic trope, so it appeared in poetry for centuries before Sotatsu painted his work and continued to be an important site of poetic reference in Japanese culture and art. But Sotatsu likely made the screen for a temple in the city of Sakai and to the south of Osaka. The temple called Shōinji, uh, during Sotatsu's time was located at the shore of Japan's inland sea. In the four, almost 400 years, uh, 400 centuries, four centuries since the making of the screens, the shoreline has receded, and Shōinji, which still exists today as a small neighborhood temple, and you see an image right here of the temple, uh, was is now in the middle of town. So the uh, the oceans have um, shifted like they do, and but during Sotas's time. The sea was right at the front doors of the temple, sort of its sound and the landscape of the ocean informing the temple's life and also its identity. So it has been argued that, and really convincingly to me, that the vista of the sea at Shōinji, right outside the doors, instead of those faraway islands in Sendai, really informed Sotatsu's work for the temple. So it's kind of Sotatsu's vision of what the ocean out of the, uh, in front of the temple might look like, which is not something that a lot of artists did either. Um, Sotatsu lived in Kyoto, and like many residents of that city today, and if you've been to Kyoto, you will know, uh, people in Kyoto don't like to leave Kyoto. And, uh, um, and even less, they like to travel far away to a region like northern Japan. So Sotatsu was a homebound person in the, in the way that many Kyoto people are still today. But um, 
I would like to think that he had a completely different idea of, of for, this, for this work in mind, meaning the sea outside. Um, Sotatsu lived and worked in Kyoto during a time of war and crises. As the capital, Kyoto was ravaged by the effects of a civil war, and many people of means had left the city, including taking painters with them, so the city, they evacuated the city to live in more peaceful um, uh, rural surroundings. But Sotatsu left behind and really filled an artistic vacuum during this time. He ran a small picture shop in Kyoto uh, that uh, specialized in ready-made but also bespoke work. So you really have to picture this as a, as, a, as a studio that you could go to almost like a shopfront window where you could go and if you had a little bit of money to spare, you could buy a fan or, or two. Or if you had more money to spare, you could buy waves of Matsushima or a, play, or a work like that. So because he filled this vacuum in this, in this time of war and crisis, he really made a name for himself and uh, started receiving commissions from regular people up to the, uh, the emperor himself. So this really embedded Sotatsu's name in history and in the artistic fabric of Kyoto. Sotatsu's tale is a rags to riches story that echoes that of Charles Lang Freer and others who admired Sotatsu in Japan's modern era. Even though the, uh, we underst uh, the understanding of Sotatsu at, at the time that Freer collected this painting may have not been as evolved as it is now, there are interesting and perhaps unintentional parallels between the two that connect them across time. Freer, who you see on the right there, is, uh, was born in Kingston, New York, to uh, a family with limited means. He left school when he was in, his, in seventh grade to enter the business world. Entering the rail car business, basically the tech industry of the day, uh, that made many Amer men of America's Gilded Age uh, fabulously wealthy, and it did so for freer, he expressed a hand in business matters, and he, making most of his money in Detroit Freer effectively created a monopoly in the railroad car business that enabled him to eventually pursue his other passions. His work in the railroad business provided many opportunities, and one of them was to travel around the United States and elsewhere, including New York, and his travels exposed him to artists like uh, James McNeil Whistler, who he really admired and came to be a segue into collecting art. This contributed to an early training of Freer in, and his eyes and aesthetic sensibilities in line and form, one which he eventually applied to when buying works like Waves of Matsushima, I would say. So Freer did something that all of us want to do. He retired at 45, four more years to go. And um, so from that point onward, uh, from his home base in Detroit, he traveled the world and visited Japan, for example, a total of five times. In 1894, he set off on a world tour that brought him first to Italy and then to the Middle East. And via South and Southeast Asia, Freer eventually reached Japan for the first time in April 1895. He spent a total of four months in Japan, by far the longest time that he spent in any country in Asia. So read, uh, I like to read Freer's diary, which is in our archives, and it, it discloses how the industrialist really experienced Japan first and foremost as a tourist. And you see him right there in, uh, with his rickshaw driver. Um, and um, so he's riding around Kyoto, for example, visiting Kiyomizudera and other temples that would be on every itinerary for any first time visitor to Japan today, even now. So he basically took a very, very much a lonely planet approach to, to accessing Japan. And this is really, I think, you know, very, uh, makes me like him even more because, uh, you know, I did the same thing when I went to Japan, of course, on a much, you know, more humble level, I guess, for the first time. Um, but it really did spark a, a special interest in Freer in Japan. I think he saw something in Japan that, uh, that he didn't, probably didn't know he was looking for in many ways. Uh, but it sparked an interest in collecting Japanese art in a way that really formed the basis of uh, his collection and his impact on, I think, the nation writ large. So the trip not only resulted in a personal affection for Japan, but it really kick-started Freer's activities as a major, if not one of the most major, collectors of Japanese art in this country or the world. 
uh, three years after the trip, Freer bought uh, his first Hoxay painting, this one, in 1898, um, at a time when he started venturing in, away from, or uh, alongside of his interest in American art to collect Asian arts writ large. Um, so, and this, uh, this painting here, Boy View Man Fuji, is still one of the favorites in our collection among our visitors. Freer acquired that painting from the collection of Ernest Fenolosa, a key figure in modern Japanese art history. Fenolosa had lived in Japan for several years and helped formulate the modern history of Japanese art, so it's really at the core of both researching and making Japanese art more known in the West, but also collecting it. He had first-rate access to artworks in Japan, both ancient and modern, and accumulated a huge collection himself. He brought it back with him to Boston as he took on the role of curating that mu the Museum of Fine Arts Japanese collections. But around 1898, as often happens, um, when Fre Freer first bought in, uh, works from Fenolosa, uh, Fenolosa was actually embroiled in a really uh, te uh, tempestuous divorce, so he was in need of money. The connection between Freer and Fenolosa is ex as explicit as that between Freer and Sotatsu is implicit, I think. They both come from humble backgrounds and entered an American high society that did not always welcome them with open arms at the beginning. Both men used the arts as a way of entering the world of taste and refinement, one as a collector and the other as a historian. For Freer and Fenolosa alike, art offered a means to cultivate themselves and engage in a field of rarefied and more often costly habits, and also to create a veneer of gentlemanliness and education. Many collectors of the Gilded Age did the same thing. So this is a common pattern, I think, amongst collectors of the, of the time that is not to be frowned upon, but really something that helped create uh, you know, uh, many, many different collections at the time. So when uh, Fenolosa's tumultuous divorce caused him to fall out of favor with Boston society, because this was really something that was frowned upon by the Brahmins of Boston, it was Freer who came to his rescue and solicited advice by him, by uh, bought parts of his collection and paid him for counsel as well. So they, but they also struck up a friendship and really kind of met in the middle of their like-minded trajectories and, uh, and very different personalities. So this is really an important moment in time that I think formed Freer's uh, um, impact on this city, but also on, on the Smithsonian. But it is also worth em emphasizing that both Freer and Fenolosa chose the arts of Japan and other Asia Asian countries as their focus. Uh, whereas other wealthy American collectors competed for old masters, often practically draining the market of them by flashing um, gargantuan astronomical sums, Freer came relatively late to the game of collecting, so the market was kind of drained already. It was true then, and it is now, that the price of a single Rembrandt painting, for example, would buy you a dozen, if not more, extraordinary Japanese paintings. Probably two dozen, I would say, almost. So in many ways, it was a combination, I think, of availability, financial resources, but also personal taste that led Freer to embark on his journey in bringing together one of the world's great collections of Asian arts. So this is really something that we, I think, I certainly benefited from working at the Smithsonian. As Freer was looking for a new home of his collection, he was shopping around a variety of places uh, in the same way as other collectors did before and after him. He was a man of strong opinions and clear ideas of how his collection was to be cared for and displayed. So, Freer contemplated a number of scenarios, and among them offered his collection to the Smithsonian. He offered this collection and funds to build a museum actually multiple times, and was turned down every time by the boards of regions of the Smithsonian. But because the Smithsonian in, in the early 20th century did not consider itself an institution of art preservation, but an institution of science, and that was kind of the founding charter that it was built upon. So, But eventually, in 19... Oh, 05, world politics intervened in Freer's favor. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 5 ended with Japan's victory over the Russian Empire, which was a seismic event that reverberated around the globe. It cannot emphasize how important and 
trem uh, tremendously impactful that event was. Japan was the first non-Western nation to defeat a Western imperialist na power in the modern age. As you all may know, the peace treaty that uh, resulted in the ending of this war uh, was brokered by uh, the American president, Theodore Roosevelt, here on the, on the right, uh, and it's called the Treaty of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, not the one in England. Um, so in that experience, with that kind of experience of seeing the world of geopolitics shift, Roosevelt be really became one of your strongest advocates uh, among the, uh, in Washington. For all his flaws and vices, Roosevelt, Roosevelt saw in the collection a way to educate the American public and the cultures of Asia, whose growing geopolitical importance he witnessed directly through that war. Roosevelt recognized the importance of understanding Asia, especially Japan at the time, and firmly encouraged the Smithsonian to accept Freer's collection and, and funds to build and sustain a museum. So just 1906, uh, just one year later, after the war in 1906, the regions of the Smithsonian accepted Freer's gift and made it uh, the first art collection to enter the Smithsonian and later, as Andy mentioned earlier, the first national art museum of the United States, which uh, to me, who's not American, always seems is really significant because I do think that it really shows an interesting, very American approach to, to culture and to the fabric of American uh, of a society, that it's not a place of Western art, but the first National Art Museum was a, a, a collection mainly of Asian arts. Following Freer's death in 1919, his collection moved from Detroit to Washington. So, and uh, Alexander Graham Bell was on the board of the Regents at the time, and he sent Freer this lovely telegram. Um, so, but the routes to Detroit uh, remain throughout that history. The Freer Gallery was designated under the same, uh, designed under the same close supervision that Freer afforded to his home in Detroit. And that home, which all of you probably have been to, right here is, this is the Freer House on Ferry Street. Um, so comparing the two, we can clearly see how the private custodianship of Freer's collection informed the public display of it. The Freer House in Detroit is no doubt grand, but emphatically private, with relatively small windows and an architectural uh, design that feels a little self-enclosed from the outside. But inside, it was a shrine to the art that he collected, and uh, in many ways was a very progressive, cutting-edge idea for public access that inspired the design and also the mission of his later museum in DC. So in many ways, the Detroit House was a testing ground, I think, and a, and a laboratory for a modern art museum. The Freer Gallery, which is here on the left, um, by contrast, is grand and airy with the Italian-inspired museum architecture that was really popular at the time. But it was meant to create a stage for, for these collections of Asian arts that is on par with Western art museums. So the architecture is really you know, intentional to create this, this, um, this really, uh, you know, prominent temple, really, of, 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 of collections. Um, and Freer was really adamant to put, uh, you know, his, uh, his Asian arts collection on exactly the same footing and, uh, and level as, uh, as Western art, which it deserves, of course. Um, so the shift from my collection to the people's collection here, I think, is really clear. Even so, in a reflection of his commitment to access and sharing his collection, Freer also in Detroit already began offering public admittance free of charge, like the Smithsonian, to his private gallery at home following its completion in 1906. So after the deal was signed with the Smithsonian, Freer started expanding and creating a, an almost like a testing ground or laboratory for, for displaying and giving access to his collection, which is really interesting. So when contrasting Freer's home with the museum, I do think that the display of Japanese art worked equally well, if not better, in the environment of Freer's own home versus the museum I'm employed for. <laughs> the same idea for skylights in the Freer house was also used in the Freer gallery. So, um, 
But the large exhibition spaces with light walls and echoing floors are actually, I think, antithetical to the intimate spaces that Japanese artworks were originally made for and are best viewed in. It is the lived with, subdued feel of Freer's own residence that gets closest to the work's original intention in an American context. So, and this leads me to the replica story. Unlike many of his contemporaries who embraced the brightly lit spaces of modern electricity, Freer understood that Japanese art was best enjoyed in the twilight. Natural light floating into his, into his viewing space at the Detroit house created an experience of each work that is different depending on the time of day or the season or even the time during the day, you know, from one moment to the next as one cloud passes by the, by the sun or reveals it. So your experience changes, it, and it really does. You need to take my word for it. This concept, even though it was realized in a space of contemporary American architecture here in the city, was, I think, at the heart of an exhibition I organized with Canon and Kyoto Culture Association in Japan this year, and this is, uh, well, on the right is a picture of that exhibition. The show just concluded at Kyoto's oldest Zen temple, Keninji. And as you have seen from the video earlier, Canon and Kyoto Culture Association specialize in creating really high level uh, facsimiles of Japanese painting to make them available to audiences in their home country of Japan. So for example, a replica of Waves at Matsushima, and this is not the original, this is a, a replica of the original, uh, was given to Shōinji, the temple that the work was originally made for. So this was a way of, of sharing the collection without actually uh, moving moving the, uh, the original work outside of the building. The replicas are really also the result of a combination of extremely high resolution photography but, and cutting edge printing with, as you saw, additional go hand applied gold leaf. So that is really a unique approach to, uh, that combines the digital and the analog, the traditional and the modern in a really interesting way. The results are really so close to the original that it is sometimes hard also for me to distinguish, which I find a little scary, but I think it is really serves the purpose. But these replicas enable um, you know, education in initiatives, exhibitions, and opportunities for cross-cultural dialogue in a way that the originals could never. For example, I have worked with ele elementary school students in Kyoto on the role of Japanese art uh, as a means of Jap Japan's soft power here in this country in the US by looking at replicas in a classroom. And uh, these kinds of experiences really, you know, make kids comfortable being around, uh, you know, artworks and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't intimidate them in a way that museums sometimes have the habit of doing. At Keninji, we brought together a, a total of 19 replicas of works almost entirely from Freer's former collection and displayed them inside a 17th century building without glass or electricity, with only the sunlight illuminating them. And here, you know, don't look at this part, look at this part where the sun kind of uh, implicitly hits, uh, indirectly, indirectly hits these uh, works. And um, I found that experience really mesmerizing and illuminating also as a, as a researcher. Um, so because suddenly I started noticing what Freer also must have seen while looking at waves at Matsushima in his Detroit home where there was no electric light in the galleries but only the uh, lights from the ceilings, uh, the skylights. The way in which the gold leaf reflects and amplifies the light and how it subtly brightens up a room's interior and how the very structure of the gold leaf is different really does come into view only in this kind of context. It was really an eye-opening experience and I wish I had a better image to kind of illustrate this for you. And this is uh, on the right, it's just a comparative for what it looks like at, uh, in, in DC in our exhibition spaces now. And this is the old Freer when, uh, shortly uh, after it opened. In many ways, the exhibition at Keninji was a return to the original idea of Freer that he had conceived at home in Detroit and transported to DC in the form of uh, the original exhibition designs for the Freer Gallery of Art. As you can see here in this picture, there are, on these photographs, there are no glass cases and no electric light anywhere. And so the absence of any, of barely any outlets in this historic building is really also 
uh, is, 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 is kind of an, a little bit of a, a headache for us as well because for just for vacuum, the spaces you need, you know, <laughs> extremely long extension cords to just clean the space. But, but it is part of the, of, the, of the idea of the space. And now I should say we do have uh, uh, electric light in the galleries as well. So it's kind of different from how it was originally done. But the concept itself, by way of a 20th century Western building, echoes to me, I think, the idea of a more nuanced experience of Japanese art, one that is unobstructed and unmediated by the effects of modern museum technology. And all of you have spotted this already, but I'm going to point it out. There is Waves of Matsushima right here, standing right in front of you. So the star of the exhibition at the Freer Gallery then, as, uh, as it was in the Keninji show, was Waves of Mat at Matsushima. Also because to me it illustrates so much about Freer in one work. And I want to spend you know, just a few minutes just thinking about that. The pair of screens was destined for Washington DC, but lived in Detroit for more than a decade after Freer purchased it, so he lived with this work here. He acquired the work from the famous art dealer Kobayashi Bunjiti in 1906, so the year that Freer sealed the deal with the Smithsonian in anticipation to creating this national collection. So in the years following that pledge, Freer intentionally started purchasing works on a much higher level than before and in larger quantities too with the aim of building that national collection. Uh, so the purchase of such famous Japanese paintings helped turn Freer's trip to Japan the year after, in 1907, the year after acquiring Waves of Matsushima into a triumphant return. Freer went to Japan a total of five times between his first trip in 1895 and his last in 1911. But the trip following his gift to the Smithsonian was probably the most important by far. So gone were the days of rickshawing around Kyoto and enter the great collector and benefactor of the country. So the purchase of waves of Matsushima along with Freer's association with Roosevelt had transformed the tourist Charles Lang Freer into the great benefactor Charles Lang Freer. The history of waves of Matsushima resonated here as it, uh, in, again in surprising ways, both at home in Detroit, in DC, and in Japan. As we have seen a few minutes earlier, the screens were made for a temple in Sakai, the ports, and that port city was a place replete with mercantile uh, and pioneering identity that at Sotatsu's time was similar to that of Detroit during Freer's time. The temple Shouinji as well was a center for merchants and still retains some of that kind of local flavor if you go there today. So these connections kind of help draw a bridge between waves at Matsushima, I believe, between the spirit of Sakai and Detroit in an un perhaps unintentional but really tangible way. Freer's home base of Detroit and its opportunities that turned him into a wealthy, well-respected person opened up other, more direct connections as well. A self-made industrialist of humble beginnings, Freer no doubt saw a kindred spirit among other people like him in his adopted home of Detroit. He also saw the same connections among Japanese industrialist collectors. Freer's relationship to Japan is really unique in many ways, but one sticks out in particular. More than in any other country he visited in Asia, he, in Japan he met self-made industrialist collectors just like himself, just like at home in Detroit. So he, I think he found a circle that resonated with him and that uh, he felt was this, uh, similar to his, home, to his home circles. On the slide here on the left, the silk and garment manufacturer Hara Tomitaro uh, engaged in a business similar to that of Freer. He was a textile uh, manufacturer and Freer, as you know, was doing rail railway cars. And both of these industries were essential to the national progress at the time, textiles in Japan and railways in America. So this identity formed as an industrialist in an industrial city connected Freer to Japan and helped embed him in circles that otherwise remained shut to many people. When Fenolosa died, Freer was invited to an exclusive memorial service at the Temple Koetsuji in northwest Kyoto. The ceremony was attended by other friends and other industrialists, such as Masuda Takashi here. There's he right next to Freer. There's Freer. There's Masuda. And um, 
so, and so strong was their connection that Masuda erected a monument at the same temple for Freer after Freer died. And the stone inscription commemorates the words spoken by Masuda at the memorial service held in 1921 and Freer died in 1919. Masuda praised Freer as a graduate of Yale, even though, as we know, Freer barely finished seventh grade. <laughs> But we cannot say whether this was part of uh, Freer's own rekindling of his life story and the way he chose to present himself to his peers, uh, but, or whether this is simply Masada, Masada's way of saying, uh, of, of uh, uh, affording him respect. So I don't know which is which, which is which. I choose to believe that it's a bit of both. But it does speak of the respect that he had built among his peers in Japan. and. Uh, respect that was created and filtered through his home and place of business, Detroit, and works like Waves at Matsushima alike. So thank you very much for listening, and I would love to hear your comments and questions, if you have any. Thank you. I'm sure I can hear you if you could. Yeah, I can. I can hear. I can hear you just fine. It's fine. Yeah, you are hitting an extremely weak spot in my De Detroit local history understanding. So I, I, I do know that his brother Watson existed, but as uh, you know, working for the Smithsonian, we are very much fascinated with free, uh, with Charles, and you know, sometimes it's hard to uh, hard to focus uh, or to to pay attention to his his family as well. But I, I was going to say what you already mentioned that yes, he lived close by, and um, I guess was married to the to one of the daughters of, of Hacker, Colonel, Colonel Hacker, his business partner, who has just lived one house uh, uh, down the road, basically. A much grander type of space than Freer's, yeah. Yes, wonderful. Thank you very much. I was afraid that those kinds of questions were coming, and I was not prepared for that. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I, uh, I really, is, I mean, somebody must have, um, I mean, I know that, you know, Watson was not involved as far as I'm, I'm aware, and I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at William right there, but I um, wasn't involved in the execution of Freer's estate, uh, as far as I can tell. I mean, he was definitely, I mean, it was definitely, uh, you know, other, um, you know, many of Freer's uh, friends, you know, who were involved in that, kind, that kind of transfer of the collection from here to DC, but something to look into. Thank you for raising that, yeah. Does, do we have a microphone now? Well, I, uh, I uh, you know, I cannot, I cannot psycho, uh, psychoanalyze Freer more than I already did, <laughs> but, uh, but I think, you, you know, I think Freer, uh, for, uh, for better or worse, really, I think he really, uh, to, to me, I think he really did notice that, uh, you know, the, 
um, Washington at the time, I think, uh, you know, also needed, uh, you know, more, more stronger representation of art, to be honest with you. At that time, nothing really existed there. Uh, there was no national gallery. There was, uh, the Smithsonian was sort of known as the National Museum, but it was really more a building that housed locomotives, you know, pieces of industry of American progress at the time. Um, so in many ways, I think this kind of, uh, rather than, and uh, I do know that he had uh, conversations with the uh, uh, museum here in Detroit as well. And I, uh, I understand too that there was not, that they weren't exactly on the same page in many ways at the time. So maybe that triggered his, uh, the, his conversation or encouraged him to look for other places as well. But his determination to really uh, have his collection at home in DC is really interesting because I do think that he was looking for a national stage. He was looking for uh, some kind of, um, to create not to create a forum to, uh, uh, to spark conversations on a national level at a time when there was really tectonic shifts of the kind that I was uh, was trying to touch on today. So I think that really did play into his his decision there. And then, who doesn't want to be invited by the president, right? I mean, like having dinner with Roosevelt was probably one of those reasons too. <laughs> yeah. Museum of Art, kind of says an institution that is basically an emporium for a lot of different things. It just did not have, had not reached a, a kind of state of connoisseurship uh, that Freer was looking for. He cared passionately about the museum in Detroit, uh, but at the same time, probably was not uh, the proper uh, place for his work. Secondly, he was a partner with, uh, and this is with James McMillan, the Center for Michigan later who was instrumental in the development of the National Mall uh, as a uh, cultural uh, hub for not just Washington, D.C., but for the nation. So he was committed to that Macmillan plan vision for the National Mall, which anticipated museums and other cultural institutions uh, at the heart of the nation's capital. So there were two reasons. Uh, but Freer was a big supporter of the Detroit Museum and its, uh, its development, which ultimately culminated in the success of Thank you. Yeah, I've, uh, I thank you. Thank you for adding that uh, that very important context. And I do. Uh, the local spirit is definitely alive. I can feel it. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I have a couple of, couple of questions. Um, first, I've read that um, uh, Sotatsu had characteristically used leaning pine trees. Could you talk a little bit about that in his waves at Matsushima? What was he trying to do? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you for asking an historical question. I feel more comfortable on that, on that <laughs> term. But, but he definitely, I think, you know, the pines, uh, pines are like a really important and long uh, lasting subject in ja traditional Japanese painting. And the way he painted them, he looked back to to an earlier time in these kinds of like gnarling, twisting, amorphous uh, trunks that the trees have, and then these crowns that sit like, a, like um, these you know needles that sit like crowns on top of them. And that type of painting is, is definitely informed by much, much earlier works. And it kind of situates Sotatsu at this the, like juncture between what uh, we think of as, the, as medieval Japan versus early modern Japan. He was right at that, uh, a threshold of this uh, shifting time that really was very palpable where society completely shifted into something that is much more akin to a modern uh, society, uh, much more uh, higher literacy, more pub uh, publishing re uh, and, and all of that. Um, um, infra uh, an art infrastructure accessible to not just the elite people, but everybody. So, so he was kind of taking bits and pieces from his own time, sort of like rekindling them and, and others he added from a more established tradition because he, I think as an artist in many ways, yes, it is always good to be progressive and to um, be, uh, you know, to, to establish something new, but at the same time, you also want to root your work in something that is more familiar. Yeah. Thank you. My second question is, um, what is it that uh, endeared people like Ogata Korin and others of the Rimpa school to um, 
uh, to try to follow in Sotatsu's footsteps? What were the elements that were so enduring and, and um, uh, that they wanted to replicate? Thank you. Yeah, another question that I love <laughs> answering because because I uh, like uh, the the Rimba school that you mentioned is, is sort of this Lu in, in Japan. There are many Italian, many different Italians, and many different lineages. But Rimba is one of those outliers that doesn't transmit its its uh, its um, you know its artistic know how directly from one sort of heir to the next, or adopted son to the next, or daughter to the next. But in this case, uh, you know, the, these artists refer to each other across time. They weren't, weren't speaking with one another directly, but referring to the legacy of them, which was something that was completely different from how traditional transmission worked. And, and I think uh, um, it's a matter of, uh, you know, both uh, Sotatsu embedded himself really, really strongly in the visual culture of Kyoto. He really became part of the, the, the local identity and the local Kyoto identity by extension, because it's the home of the imperial court, is part of the sort of almost like a national artistic identity that is being uh, you know, preserved and nurtured there. And so in that way, I think artists later were seeing that role and access that, uh, that market that he created, for lack of a better word, and really tried to build on the brand that Sotatsu had established for himself. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Um, I recently saw a film called Edo Avant-Garde. Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to the video at the front of uh, the beginning of, of this, uh, it was my understanding uh, from hearing from the filmmaker that a lot of art that would be considered national treasure was taken from the country early and through that film, they were rediscovering a lot of uh, these beautiful silk screens that collectors and museums had taken. Is that part of the motivation for that project to recreate and make those great reproductions that? Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, issues of provenance are always, uh, you know, at the forefront of many museums and curators' work. And but. At this day, in this case, I mean, the, um, that was definitely part of our uh, intention of engaging in the Tsuri project to begin with, because it enabled us to share the collections without the collections leaving, <laughs> leaving the building. But it didn't just do that. I mean, it's not necessarily, I don't look at it as, as a repatriation, but really as a, as a, as a way of shared stewardship between uh, you know, there are these replicas homes in Japan and the home of the original in DC. So, and it really it does enable a totally different kind of engagement with these works, right? I mean, they don't fall under the same rules of exposure and you know, the limitations that the originals would fall into because we do want to preserve them, not just for the 100 years that the museum has been around, but for the next whatever, however long there is the city of Washington. <laughs> and um, so I think it really, it really serves a dual purpose or many other purposes as well in that, in that way. And, I, uh, I personally like the project because it really is this wonderful kind of sweet spot in between, um, you know, contemporary technology and really, you know, this high-res photography that Canon is performing versus the, um, um, this um, unison with, with the traditional uh, arts and crafts of going to uh, building the frame of the screens, for example, that go into applying the gold leaf because it's not just applied in any way, it's, it's applied exactly the same way as in the original, which is, you know, a level of detail uh, that is astounding and really uh, is the only reason, I think, why I wanted to do this exhibition in, in at Keningi, because the temple is, you know, a really famous site in Kyoto, and uh, the works that you want to display there need to meet that kind of standard, I think, and the replicas, this, uh, this level of attention that they received, um, to me, did that, accomplished that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, do we know the process and tools, materials that Maestro used and how we use them? 
yes, yes, we do know uh, sort of the kinds of brushes he used. Uh, we uh, uh, we know the um, you know the pigments that the pigments that uh, that he used. Like there has been also and um, you know the brushwork. You know you can can kind of tell by looking and the pigments, of course. But then we also at the museum have, and this is another. And I want to draw the arc again back to here. <laughs> We have one of the, uh, you know, the, the biggest Asian art uh, conservation and science scientific research facility on premises, and that has been the case since the founding of the museum. And our scientists and conservators perform, uh, you know, analysis of the of the works of non-invasive analysis of the works as they are caring for them and found um, and constantly find out interesting aspects about the works. So, so that is uh, that definitely kind of, uh, you know enriched my understanding for, uh, you know, Sotatsu's process beyond of what I found in, say, so, uh, you know, sources of his time. I'm particularly interested in, um, first first of all, is, there, is it gold leaf? Is it, is right. it gold leaf he's using or is it a powder? Yes. So it's a sheet? Yes, it's the uh, it's a gold leaf in the early 17th century. Uh, uh, so gold leaf changes over the course of the Edo period. So in the early 17th century, there wasn't, uh, there were, uh, so, um, mines that harvested uh, gold in Japan, but not many, not as many as were discovered in the 18th and 19th centuries. So the gold was incredibly expensive and ended up being slightly impure at the time because, because it, was, it, was, it was just very hard to, to come by and or harder than it would be eventually. So, and that gives the gold a different type of color in a kind of, the grid is not perfect. It's not, it's not this kind of regular chess uh, board grid that eventually was possible because if you if you made a mistake or you had to use every part of the leaf, you couldn't just use the perfect square leaf every time. But if it broke, you needed to use the rest of the of the material as well because you couldn't just, you know, be as wasteful, for example, as, uh, as uh, uh, in, in later <coughs> ages. So, um, <Okay>. yeah. <coughs> was there any, um, excuse me, um, Varnishes used, and if so, what were they? <coughs> and does he have any? Did he leave any records? Did he leave any diaries of his process? So the last question is a, is a no. Um, there is no. Uh, uh, Sotatsu's uh, words uh, do not survive, and um, also having worked on other artists uh, of his uh, level and background in in the same period. The language that, uh, or the level of, of written, uh, of, of, of writing, was not as uh, as high amongst uh, people of his background, for example, at the early in the early Edo period. So, um, oftentimes communication was very simple, uh, written communication. So that's one of the reasons, most likely, why why not uh, not many writings by him survived because they weren't preserved. He most certainly communicated with people who made the the, uh, the, the apparatus that his screen, the, the framework of his screens, or he who sourced the materials for him. But the, but the reason why diaries or letters are preserved over time is because of the, often of because of the calligraphy or because of the content. So they were kind of treasured as, as, as objects on, onto themselves and so and because of the level of literacy among people of Sotatsu's background, you know, um, people at the time didn't consider them worthy of, uh, of, of preserving. Um, and the varnish question, um, um, yeah, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I don't think there is such, uh, his uh, waves of Matsushima don't, ha don't, to my knowledge, don't have any coding other than the animal glue that is, uh, that is essential to keep the, the pigments from flaking off. And this is also something that in conservation uh, occasionally needs, uh, needs to be reapplied because the, the material loses its, 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 its adhesive uh, quality over time. Thanks. No, it only smells when you boil it. <laughs> you should try it out, it's interesting. <laughs> Back here. Okay. I had a quick question about the timeline of um, making the replicas. What's that process like? 
Uh, uh, yes, um, I, uh, it depends. <laughs> Like, uh, so um, it takes about six months to make one of these replicas because the first step is, uh, you know, the team comes to your institution, they come to DC and, you know, um, it takes a while to set up and then they start doing photography and then they come back like uh, two months later with the print, uh, with, the, with all the prints and do the color adjustments. So the color is just right and, you know, as close as possible to the original and they bring their humongous printer <laughs> with them uh, um, and um, so, and then they go back and then, you know, the, the frame is being created by the artisan that you saw in the video, for example, or, and then, you know, the gold leaf uh, uh, is, uh, is applied by the art, by the art, by another artist. So, and because the, this kind of the manual, the, the analog part of the, of the creation process can only be performed by this limited number of people because there aren't enough people out there uh, who are skilled and knowledgeable in this area anymore that um, you know there's only you don't have you know a big uh, rolodex of people who could work on this so that takes time and so six months is about the time to create a work like this for example and I know that because for the exhibition we created three specially made for the exhibition um, that are going to remain in Japan in different institutions but um, so each of them took about that long to make yeah Thank you for your question. Oh. Thank you again, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you.